Hello PMM Festival. I'm Eric Manser, VP of Product Marketing at Crayon and your host for the day's festivities. The Product Marketing Alliance is the incredible industry organization who puts on this event and my company Crayon is proud to be this year's title sponsor. Who is Crayon? Well, we're recognized as the industry leader in market and competitive intelligence software. Product marketers at some of the biggest names in enterprise technology like Salesforce, HubSpot, Dropbox, and Gong use our tool set to activate competitive intelligence all over their organization, not just for narrow use cases or to accomplish lower funnel objectives. But don't take my word for it, industry organizations like the PMA itself, independent market research firms like Forrester, and the enthusiastic reviews from our own users on G2 have said the exact same thing about Cram. Just a few moments ago, you saw a presentation from Sridhar Ramanathan from Aventi Group, who talked about the fundamentals of bringing a new product to market. This next presentation is kind of like the flip side of that strategy, the process by which you can successfully take a product off the market. Delivering a presentation entitled, Effectively Executing an End-of-Life Strategy, please welcome Janine Jurji, a Senior Product Marketing Manager at Later. tuning in today. This session is going to chat about executing an effective end-of-life strategy. And I really hope by the end of it that you will love sunsetting a product just as much as you lo love uh, launching one because they're both equally as important. My name is Janine Jurji and I am the Senior Product Marketing Manager at Leta where I've just recently joined uh, just over a month ago. And uh, if you're not familiar with Leita, we're an all-in-one social marketing platform built specifically for small to medium businesses. And if you're not uh, using Leita to manage your social media channels, you are most likely using it or interacting with it through that coveted link in bio link. I've also just recently signed on as the, uh, or one of the hosts for the PMMM Talks, which the Product Marketing Alliance puts on. Um, and I host a monthly session on anything to do with product marketing. Um, and so if you'd like to be involved or come on the show and have a chat, I'd love to, I'd love to talk to you. Um, we can brainstorm ideas together, um, have a panel, etc. cetera, um, all for it. Uh, so what makes me so knowledgeable on this particular subject? As I mentioned, I'd only just started it later. So actually most of my sunset experience is in my previous roles, which were more in the B2B enterprise SaaS space, where sales enablement was a really huge portion of that and obviously affected how we kind of did the rollout for um, a launch for a sunset. And I love sunsets. Um, I think they're super important. And I, um, I think we need to change the narrative on turning it in from a negative thing into a positive thing, because there's obviously great things. Um, and I guess one of the reasons I love sunsets so much um, is because I'm fairly organized. Um, I can't handle clutter. Um, if I buy something, I like, um, I want to get rid of something. And so I think for me, like sunset <laughs> product sunsets make me so happy because uh, you're really focusing in on, um, on the stuff, the stuff that works really well. So hopefully by the end, you'll come along this journey with me. So the term end of life, um, for obvious reasons, is kind of going out of fashion a little bit. And I think people in the industry are looking to also change the narrative around the negative connotations with uh, sunsetting a product. Um, it's not an end of life. Um, and the reason I love the term product sunset is a sunset is a lovely thing. Um, it brings out the crowd. Everyone loves it. 
Um, and it's, it should be celebrated. Uh, end of life being or sunsetting a product uh, is not a bad thing. We've learned a lot of things on the way. Other terms um, that are quite common is retiring a product, unshipping, uh, removing um, a product or feature from your suite or to deprecate it. So let's make a pact here. Um, I want us all to uh, change the narrative uh, on sunsets um, and really uh, not see them as a failure because they're not. Um, and we should really be celebrating retiring a product or feature just as you would a launch. So incentivizing teams that way, um, you know, it's not a wasted effort. There's so much learning that happens. We know so much more about our customers. Um, and so I'd really like to make the case here uh, to, to change the narrative um, and turn it into a really positive thing. So why would you want to unship um, or sunset a product or feature? Uh, I love this high level example by Reforge. Uh, if you uh, haven't heard of Reforge, you should totally check them out. Such a great uh, resource and a wealth of knowledge for product marketers and product managers um, and a whole bunch of other roles, to be honest. And so there's lots of reasons, um, as you can see here. And the ones that I've come across the most are strategic alignment. And this is arguably the most important one. Um, misalignment to the company strategy um, is an important reason to, to get rid of a product or feature. I've had features that are buggy. So they've maybe been stagnant or left for a little while. And then they're providing a kind of a bad experience for, uh, for our customers. And then I've had ones that are too niche. So maybe only a small set of our customers are, are using them. And to be honest, I've, I've been in times where all three of those cases are true, um, which you know, makes for an easier case to sunset a product. So let's, let's get into it. Um, I'm going to take you through um, my sunset go-to-market framework. And it's really six steps that you want to consider or think about um, as, you're, as you're going through kind of everything from the sunset conversation through to the execution to your customer base. Stakeholder alignment. So sunsetting a product is a whole company effort, um, which generally means there's a lot of stakeholders, which us product marketers are very familiar with. And so you really want to make sure you pull together stakeholders from each team and then that you appoint a decision maker. Um, this is gonna help make sure that you're considering all the different perspectives and getting all the information you need to know exactly uh, what the right rollout strategy is and the messaging. Um, you want to catch any red flags like right off the get go. And if there's any big, big things that you need to address. And most importantly, just to get buy in. Um, very rarely does everyone agree on whether or not um, a feature or product should be sunsetted. And by bringing everyone together and giving everyone a chance to, uh, to tell you their thoughts and to, to be part of that decision, we'll make sure that you get buy-in within that group, but then also as you disseminate that decision throughout the organization. To create that alignment, obviously you need to level up to something um, and you need to have a, um, some kind of decision-making criteria. And so it's really important to set the stage on your company strategy. Being really clear on what that is so you can see if this particular feature or product aligns um, and really decide on the sunset criteria, whether um, you know, for a particular thing, it's revenue, it's a usage, it's misalignment with company strategy, is it so buggy? There's, I mean, there's a lot of things, but you wanna make sure that you really set the stage here so that you're all aligned from the get-go. And be cognizant that whilst I am making a case to um, turn the sunset um, into a positive thing, which needs to happen at all levels of the organization, it can be a bit of a sensitive subject for some. You know, they might see their um, 
their career growth, their opportunities have been tied to the launch of a specific feature or the success of one. Um, but you, so you want to be cognizant of that when you're having those conversations with different stakeholders and then towards the end as you get into more of the communication side and messaging with your internal internal teams. But this is why turning it into a positive thing is really important and celebrating sunsets as you would um, a launch, which I mentioned earlier. Um, I've even seen like some teams are incentivized on sunsetting as they would be a launch so that um, product managers can make that decision or product marketing managers as well if you're if you're in, when you're in that together. So once you've formed your group, um, the first thing you'll need to do is gather your competitive intel um, and really clarify what the landscape looks like today. You know, you might not have done this uh, analysis since the product was initially launched. And so the landscape might have changed. You might not know where you fit in anymore. Um, are you still priced right? Um, most importantly, can you even win in your space anymore? You know, there's a reason this, this product or feature is up for this discussion. So you wanna, you wanna gauge what's happening in the industry. Um, a friend of mine works at Unbounce, which is a landing page builder. Um, and she, I was telling her that I was um, working on this presentation and she mentioned that one of their customers had five landing page builders that he had access to through various subscriptions um, and apps that he, that he had access to. Um, and he was only using Unbounce for, for his landing page as his main landing page builder. So do all of those other four need to exist? Probably not all of them. And is it table stakes or is this feature something your customers think they're gonna grow into? Um, and what I mean by that is um, when a customer is making that decision or the buyer is making that decision to go with you, is this something that they need to see? Does it need to be listed on their website? Um, just, just for you to even be um, part of that consideration process. Do they maybe think that it's something they'll grow into? Uh, and so they wanna see that there, but they might never, they think it's gonna be something they use um, and they never actually end up using it. Uh, I've been in a situation where that was the case. We had one product, um, we kept hearing that, you know, this is the year, this is the year, this is the year and um, for it. And it, it just never quite got there, but it, we, it kept coming up in RFPs. So, you know, you, really understanding your buyer and your user here is so important. And then we get into customer data, which is my favorite um, and often the hardest information to pull on usage information. And I've crossed out product adoption here um, and put in product uh, active usage is because just because a client or customer has something enabled doesn't mean they're actually using it. So you really want to get the right data here um, so you can see who, who is actually using this product. And active in your company, you know, might mean different things. Like it, it could be logging in once a day. It could be um, posting to Instagram a few times a week. Whatever that criteria is, um, agree on it as a company to really segment uh, your your information and see who is actually using uh, who is actually actively using this product. And then once you've got that, are they the right customers that are using it? Um, you could be focused on enterprise, and you're finding that it's a lot of like smaller uh, smaller customers that are making use of making use of this feature. So really, uh, really understanding if those strategic clients are using it and if it's bringing value to the, to the right segment. If you have post decision information, um, it's really great to dig into why customers that had it had stopped using it or had canceled. Um, and it really helps you kind of uh, make sure you gather that information to make the decision, obviously. Um, and it gives you a bit of insight into the um, into some of the problems that are within that feature. You know, you could be um, a tomato that's trying to convince everyone that you're a fruit. But if I want a fruit, I'm going to go buy something else. So you want to make sure you understand exactly how um, how you're being viewed. 
and then chatting about uh, to your current users and finding out why they love it and what pain points it's solving. Maybe there's another way you can solve for this pain point. Um, and this information too is super valuable for your messaging. Um, so it kind of allows you to figure out how to address um, how to address it as you get to that stage. When we get into revenue and costs, um, this is really going to be more um, relevant for products that have their own PL or things like add-on add -on products that uh, have separate revenue attached. For features that are part of a plan, it's obviously quite difficult to attach, uh, to attach a dollar amount to it, but every organization is different. And when, when we talk about costs, it's important to consider hard costs, like your, your tech stack, um, but also time. Um, the time to have this conversation, developer time to get stuck back into it, especially if it's a product that you don't have much, um, that you're not into day to day. So we've all been in this situation. I've looked at a customer contract um, and I see they have access to certain products, but they're not, um, they're not actually paying for it. Um, so really looking at this information of the, of your customers that are actually using this product, how many of them are paying for it? And, and this is more common in that enterprise space because we create custom packages and we bundle everything in sometimes, or we throw in things for free to close the deal. So really understanding what, what that looks like. Um, and obviously that's a problem of doing that um, in contracts and bundling things in and throwing them in for free is that later you get to this point and it's hard to prove the value because people aren't paying for it. So a note to mention to your salespeople. And then you want to look at how much it costs you to maintain. Um, we were once in a situation where we had an app that hadn't been touched in a long time, but we had a solid group of power users that loved it. And because it hadn't been touched in a long time, the tech stack was so old, we couldn't, it was buggy, we couldn't build anything on it. If we wanted to fix anything or perfect, um, add any functionality, we had to build the whole thing from scratch, um, which I guess, depending on how you look at it, makes this sunset decision easier because it's do we invest and build this whole thing from the beginning? Um, so looking at what it costs you to maintain and to continue to maintain and invest, because obviously anything in your product suite uh, sets the expectation that you're continuously iterating on it and are continuously looking to provide a better experience. So be cognizant of that too. And then look at the opportunity cost. Um, Often the conversation around a sunset is why we shouldn't sunset, why we, sh why we shouldn't end of life, why we need to keep it, here's the positive impact. But it's also important to look at the flip side of that. What could all our teams be working on uh, instead um, if we freed up their time? What could, what could we build? Obviously our roadmap is like filled with things that we can't get to. Is there a whole new, um, a whole new vertical that you're considering? Whatever that is, like create the positive spin on that. So you can understand, so that you're really kind of comparing apples to apples. Um, it's not just about losing something, it's about creating an opportunity for something else. And you've got all this knowledge that you've learned from this example that you're gonna transfer to other areas of the business. When we get to this section, messaging and segmentation, uh, at this stage, the decision to sunset has officially been made. Uh, and you might get to the stage and be like, you know what, actually, after doing the competitive analysis, there's actually um, uh, a play for us here that we hadn't considered. So doing that research is valuable regardless. Um, it really just allows you to level set again on where this feature fits in within your market, within your customer base, and what you want to do going forward. But this is a sunset presentation, and so we will proceed as though uh, all our group of stakeholders have loved the data that we have presented, and we are on board with sunsetting the product. 
One thing I will say on this is please do not forget to share the news internally. You know, we, we often get so wrapped up on our, um, on our go to market and market being market being customers that we forget to share the news internally and bring our own team and company in on, on that decision making. Um, and, you know, the, the celebrating of the sunset happens at this level as well. You want to you want to praise the teams that have done such a good job of bringing it to this. Talk about what you've learned, why it's been great. Um, be transparent um, about the reasons why it hasn't worked out. Like what great learnings that you can share with the team. And then talk about the opportunity. What is this going to free everyone up to do um, and get everyone excited about that? And once you've done that, you move on to the customer and same thing, be transparent with them on, um, on the decision and share what you'll be investing in instead. You know, that could look like showing them a high level roadmap that have, you know, more themes and you're not talking about specific features. We, um, on one sunset I was working on, what we decided to do was after we sent out the communication, we invited our strategic clients to have a fireside chat with us and our leadership team and our product, our product team. And the reason we wanted to do that is we don't want them thinking about the, the sunset in a negative way. And this was a quite a big product. So we wanted to go do a little, go a little bit extra for it. And it allowed, what well, what we wanted to do is bring them in um, and give them the opportunity to ask questions, ask questions about why, where we'll be um, investing in instead. And obviously the areas that we're investing in are things that they want. Like we're, we're investing in areas that can help them grow their business. And, you know, they understand we can't do everything. Your customers will understand that. You can't do everything well. And so you're really focusing on this particular area or this, um, this group of areas to, to spend your time. And then you want to segment to provide the right level of attention and care. So you can send the same email blast out to everyone, unfortunately, as easy as that would be. You've got, you've got power users, you've got your strategic clients, you've got clients that your client managers might have really good relationships with. And so you really want to give the right level of care to each group. I find what can be helpful here is giving client managers a list and having them decide how they want to proceed. You'll obviously have an idea of who your strategic clients are and you're going to give them that VIP treatment no matter what. Uh, and then you can let your client managers decide what the best thing is for, for the remaining. And goes without saying, obviously create that narrative, um, a consistent narrative of the messaging through email, through the one-on-one -on -one conversations, through the fireside chat. Whoever is going to be having those conversations or creating your content, make sure you're providing um, your positioning as you would for a launch to make sure you get that consistency and that message goes out as you had planned. Uh, for client managers that are having one-on-one -on -one conversations, Create talking points for them. Are there uh, different configurations that, um, that you need to consider? So some clients might have to do this, some might have to do this, some might have to do this. Um, outline that so they're armed and ready to have the conversations and um, anticipate any Q and A's just so that they feel confident in what's happening um, and they're portraying the, this as a good news story. You know, if they don't know anything, they, they might set um, a more negative tone or if there's so much uncertainty, it might not set, set the right message. And then we get into timelines and rollout, which is where uh, project management heaven, I guess. Um, so you wanna set clear timelines for the entire sunset period. That being when, uh, when different milestones are, when you need to send out reminders where the final sunset, when the final sunset date is, uh, and then what needs to happen after the sunset. 
Um, don't forget to, to close off workflows or end subscriptions or delete data or save data or whatever that might be. Make sure you're really thinking about this end to end. Oh, and obviously you're, when you're gonna share internally with, uh, with your staff as well. And then you wanna segment here as well. And the reason you wanna do that is because um, you've got leads, you've got new customers that have just signed on and getting access, and then you've got long-term customers that have been using it and they're the ones you're gonna create a good timeline for. So for example, when do you remove the product from your website? Do you do that straight away? When do you remove it from your pricing page? When do new customers no longer see this new feature when they log into the app? Uh, and then obviously your longer term customers will see it for you know, whatever that timeline is until the sunset date is. So really thinking about when those are, um, those are happening and um, rolling that into your timeline. And when we're talking about how long, you know, there's no definitive answer or right and wrong. It really depends on what your product is. You know, it could be anywhere from 30 days to maybe a year. Uh, and it really depends on the switching costs. What do your users have to do to find something else? What's the level of investment? So really being clear on that for, for your own space will help, help you set the timeline there. And obviously stakeholders can help you. There might be certain milestones to, that you need to consider. And if you can, why not go the extra mile and recommend partners or vendors at a discounted rate? If you have a lot of, um, a lot of customers using something, you might be able to negotiate a group buying power um, because you've got a lot of people that are going to transition onto the new solution. It might be an awesome opportunity for a partnership. You know, if, if you can vet, if you can vet some options and provide them, um, provide them with something to transition to, save them time, show them you care. Why not do that um, if, it's, if it's within your power? And then remind customers of the sunset date. They will not always go willingly. Um, I had one, <laughs> one product I was working on we, where we were no longer supporting uh, certain payments terminals with our uh, point of sale. And you know, we couldn't just turn them off because we could see that they were still being used um, and we needed our clients to be able to process payments. So after, you know, millions of reminders, we, we ended up having to get our legal team involved and having them outline like the risks um, associated with, um, with continuing to support them, like for us and for the customer. So depending on what your space is, be aware that you might have to extend your timeline or pull different levers. Um, maybe you're, I don't know, your leadership team needs to call some customers, whatever that might be, it just depends. Sometimes you can just turn it off, but obviously just be wary of that in your space. Reminders are very important and check-ins. And whatever you do, um, do not tell your customers that you're going to sunset a product or feature and then forget to sunset said product or feature. Um, I've seen this happen. Um, it makes you lose credibility. It makes it so much harder to get them off the product later because they no longer believe um, believe that you are going to end of life it. And uh, it's not a good look for for your brand. You know, you're saying this is no longer worth investing in, um, and then it gets left behind. What does that say about the things that you are continuing to invest in? So really make sure that you follow that end to end and make sure all workflows are done um, before moving on to another product. Um, you know, if you use a project management tool, I like to load all this stuff in right at the beginning um, so that you, you, you have reminders to turn off workflows and everything like that. So it's not based on um, just purely remembering. And then also, uh, Avoid a limbo state at all costs. Uh, a limbo state is basically when the feature should be killed, um, but the team doesn't move forward with removing it, and it dies a very, very slow and sad death. Um, and you don't want to get end of life because you didn't end of life at the right time. We could all be watching Blockbuster every night, but we're not. 
So I invite you to join me on this quest to change the narrative on, um, on product sunsets. Let's see them as a, um, as a celebration of we've learned a lot of things. Um, it's allowing us to focus on new things. And let's celebrate um, retiring a product or feature as you would a launch um, and incentivize teams that way. Thank you so much for listening to me today. Um, I, if you have any questions, I would love to hear from you um, about this topic or any other topics. And also, if you would like to be on the PMM Talks show, which is held by the Product Marketing Alliance, I would love to have you. Um, we can brainstorm topic ideas, as I mentioned. Um, my LinkedIn handle there is there if you want to reach out. Thank you so much, guys. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. Hi, I'm Eric Manser, VP of Product Marketing at Crayon and your host for day two of the 2021 PMA Product Marketing Festival. My company, Crayon, is proud to be the title sponsor for this year's event, and we couldn't be more excited about it. Crayon has had a long-standing relationship with the Product Marketing Alliance and with product marketers all over the world. Our customers rely on our software to track, analyze, and act upon competitive intelligence data from around the internet and through their own communications networks. They then activate that CI data through a variety of tools that help enable their sales, customer success, product, and executive teams. I've been a product marketing leader for quite a few years now, and I've written my share of snappy titles. But this next presentation has a top line that I'm particularly jealous of. What are the biggest obstacles that product marketing teams face in delivering a successful cross-functional product launch? How can you overcome them? By the end of this highly interactive session, you'll come away with the answers to both of these crucial questions. With their presentation entitled, Collaborate, Communicate, Conquer, how to Ace Market Launches with Reich's Proven Go-To-Market Playbook. Oh, I love that title. Here's Reich's Global Head of Product Marketing, Amit Pandey, and Product Marketing Manager, Su Wan Wang. Do you have the creative brief? Go fish! Do you have the project's deadline? Go fish. Take back control of work. Reich helps your team work as one. Got it! Welcome to Collaborate, Communicate, Conquer, How to Ace Marketing Launches with Reich's Proven Go-to-Market Playbook. Today, we'll share how our own global go-to-market strategies helped us at Reich scale our business through dynamic market shifts, which subsequently led to our successful acquisition by Citrix. We'd love to begin by sharing with you a little bit about our backgrounds. I'll start by introducing my co-host, Amit Pandey. Amit leads the product, competitive, and technical marketing teams at Reich. Prior to Reich, he was the CMO at two AI SaaS startups, including TACT, which is the only AI startup backed by Salesforce, Amazon, and Microsoft. In a past life, he also led marketing and product teams at HP, Yahoo, and Oracle. Amit is a graduate of Stanford University Sloan Graduate School of Business, and he is an active volunteer with Bay Area nonprofits. Thanks, Suan. It's my pleasure to introduce Suan Wang. Suan is an experienced high-tech uh, product marketing leader. Um, she manages a portfolio of different products and solutions here at Reich, including 
for IT teams prior to write. Swan has spent over 10 years working in a variety of marketing, sales, and partner facing roles at companies like Google, AMD, Quotient, and Instapage, which later became PostClick. Um, Suan um, is also passionate about volunteering and uh, spends time with uh, the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network and in her free time, uh, loves playing with, uh, with Latte, her German Shepherd. Thank you, Amit. Uh, we have also included our LinkedIn profiles URL here. If you'd like, please feel free to connect with us. We'd love to hear from you. So for those of you who are not familiar with Reich, here is a quick summary of who we are. Reich is the leader in collaborative work management or CWM. We were founded in 2006 and acquired by Citrix earlier this year in 2021. We're based in Silicon Valley and have over 1200 employees globally. We have 20,000 customers, organizations around the world across all industries who use Reich to manage their work and collaborate with their teams. We are the only CWM platform that can be used across the entire enterprise or fully configured for any line of business or use case. And as you can see here, our customers range from very large multinational enterprises with hundreds of thousands of employees like Google to smaller fast growth organizations like Gwenny B and even nonprofit organizations like Children's Hope International. In this session, we will be covering a few key topics. We'll be talking about the current state of product marketing, We'll be sharing Reich's formula for successful go-to-market launches, which is a repeatable formula that we have tested over thousands of global launches across dozens of different countries. And we're gonna share some key takeaways that you can take immediate action on. Amit will start us off by sharing what the current market looks like and challenges product marketers are facing today. Amit, please take it away. Thanks, Suan. You know, if we have to truly, as product marketing teams, uh, practitioners and leaders, be ready for the future, we have to have a good point of view on how we got here in the first place. And so I'd briefly like to talk a little bit about the present moment we're in and how that shapes the new charter for product marketing. Um, and lead into um, how to then talk about product marketing launches. You know, if you, even if you weren't around in the year 2000 when Salesforce famously launched its no software campaign and unofficially um, kickstarted the cloud era, you know that um, the word digital transformation has been around for a while. And I like to think about the last 20 years as being this first wave of digital transformation for companies, very much like the first 10 to 20 years of electricity, automobile, semiconductors, and other waves of technology that came before software. Now, during this wave, if you really think about it, we saw um, an incredible um, installation, if you will, of uh, SaaS products across every business, every workflow, and every team and then last year when the pandemic hit and we all went into the world of remote work, we truly also embarked on the next wave of digital transformation, right? So the first wave of digital transformation was just about getting everybody into the cloud and get comfortable with operating in that virtual environment. What we've all gone through in a very accelerated fashion in the last 14 months or uh, 16 months or so is the start of a new wave of digital transformation, which looks different, feels different, and will have huge implications for us as product marketing, as we'll cover next. Now, specifically, I'd like you to focus on the top half of the, of the slide first, because there are three forces 
that are converging together to squeeze us as product marketers and perhaps challenge us to bring the best of our creative and strategic thinking to the table. The first is that the speed of change in the digital world is actually increasing, right? So, you know, in, in 200 milliseconds, which is, um, which is uh, something that happens faster than the blink of an eye, billions and billions of ad spend is transacted through algorithms. You know, customers are choosing products and discarding products faster than ever before. The speed of change is at the level of the market, at the level of investments, at the level of entire product categories, you know, being born and dying faster. The competition itself is more fierce than ever before, even through the pandemic. So even in the pandemic year, if you look at the world of marketing technologies, which um, the world of, which is the world that Suwan and I and all of us operate in, in this world, we had 8,000 technologies launched. Now, even if you've been in marketing for 10 years, you can probably call off maybe a few dozen technology names at the top of your head, right? So how do you compete in a landscape with 8,000 um, new you know, players coming in you know, every year? So the market is changing faster, the competition is changing faster, and ultimately the biggest force in this game, which is customers, their expectations are also rising. You know, fully 86% customers say now that you know, they demand more from the digital experiences that um, they experience today in 2021, and they're willing to pay more, which is a great thing if we can respond to that change. But on top of that squeeze, there's also an additional layer, which you see here below on this slide that I'd like to quickly touch upon, which is that, you know, we all got forced into remote work and quickly realized that there's more to it than just Slack and Zoom. We are facing more operational complexity as we try to structure deals and we try to wrangle people and wrangle data across different geographies and time zones with literally no office locations in most cases in the last year. And whether it's artificial intelligence or 5G or blockchain or any other technology that you trend that you follow, you know that even three to five years ago, we weren't even talking about those technologies. So we're getting squeezed externally, we're getting squeezed internally. And we've spoken about the story, but let's actually take a look at the numbers. The numbers paint um, a picture which you can look uh, through a lens half of a glass half full or you know, of a glass half empty. Um, but this is why um, you know, I think it's important to look at how these numbers have changed over the last year. Citrix and Reich together have conducted several studies in the last six to nine months including with hundreds of business decision makers. And these are some of the numbers that have come out. One out of two employees is really frustrated because they have too many tools. They're feeling burnt out. They want more analytics in their work. One out of two people is spending twice as much time on collaboration. And Suan and I can certainly attest to this from our experience here at Reich. And all of this means that the productivity of the average knowledge worker for whom we might build software is lower than it's been. But if you look at all these numbers and you reverse the roles, this is us in a nutshell. This means that between Suan and me, one of us is feeling these things, right? Or if you work in a team with 50 people, 25 people are feeling some of these things. And so if you think about the squeeze we spoke about and these numbers, as product marketers, we can be very creative armed with just our content and a spreadsheet, right? And often many of us, when we started our careers, we had a spreadsheet, um, we used our spreadsheet to launch things and between our outlook, our spreadsheet and our creative assets, we could launch products, right? But that day of fighting with sticks and stones is over. You know, the, the, new, the next wave of digital transformation that we are headed to, it just demands a much more versatile and intelligent way of launching products. And that's what we'll share with you with some practical tips in the rest of this presentation. But first, let's talk about how all these forces are creating a new charter for product marketing in 2021 and beyond. If you look at some of the points that are mentioned in the slide, I'd like to frame this for you in the language of people, process, and technology. So the first two points here relate to people. You know, ultimately as marketing in the same way that we create three to five times exposure with a new market 
to even get our voices to be heard. We need to apply those same principles in communicating our value in the language of hard metrics, um, whether it's share of voice or pipeline or bookings to our executive stakeholders. They're just like customers. They need to be reminded of our value. We also have to bring together more stakeholders than ever before. Um, this is the perfect time for the catalyst function that product marketing faces to bring together newer kinds of stakeholders, both on the product and go-to-market side, because we're the only people that sit in the middle of both of these functions. Talking a little bit about process, one of the big changes in 2021 goals is that if the market is changing fast, customers are changing fast, and categories and competitors are changing fast, it means we need to be agile in the way we respond to these market needs, including with our product launches. Um, it is simply not possible to have 10-year launch plans or even five-year launch plans unless you're Apple. And even if you're Apple, you probably don't have five-year launch plans for emerging categories versus mature categories, right? Think the Apple Watch versus the Apple Car versus the Mac. It's also really important from a process perspective that in the same way that we are building purpose-built software for the users we serve, we use purpose-built software ourselves. Often people say that, hey, my product marketing team doesn't have a lot of budget and we don't really use a lot of tools outside of Google Slides and you know spreadsheets and maybe a few other tools. I would challenge those product marketing teams to think about how your own workflow, our own workflow can benefit from purpose-built digital products, whether it's for technical marketing, competitive marketing, or even story and idea generation for launches. The last point I'd mention here, building on people and process is technology. Ultimately, uh, there are a lot of different technologies that you can leverage to um, launch in this new world. If you have reusable templates, and we'll cover some of those in our presentation later today, then those templates can be a great way for you to be systematic and methodical in your approach of launching new products. So I would love to hear your perspectives on people, process, and technology, and how um, these um, very complex problems can be addressed by product marketers. Yeah, so people, process, and technology are definitely elements that are top of mind for us here when we approach our work. Um, let's take a peek at our go-to-market framework that we have built um, on top of these elements that can help you thrive in today's ultra-dynamic environment. So as you can see here, there are three critical elements to this framework. The first key element is people. So we are talking about a person that functions as a program or project manager for your launches. And this is highly recommended if your launch involves more than 15 contributors across multiple cross-functional teams. Um, but, you know, as PMMs, we all know that more often than not, we are the ones who actually have to take on the project management role while being pressed for more and faster launches in an increasingly competitive landscape. But if you can, having a designated PMO to help manage the launch would be ideal. It would certainly make things a lot easier. So the second key element here is having an agile go-to market process. Uh, agile methodology is especially beneficial for any product launch or campaign that has to be executed very quickly in a rapidly changing environment, which as we all know has become the norm. It's really the reality that we live in today. So last year when we had to suddenly pivot in response to the pandemic, our team at Reich implemented a marketing version of Agile that really helped us optimize our campaigns and drive growth in a super fluid environment with near zero visibility of the road ahead. So finally, the third thing I wanna to touch on is having a collaborative work management platform that unifies all of your launch 
and work activities into a single digital workplace where everything can be planned, executed, and tracked. Especially if you're a PMM acting as a project manager in these launches, um, with the increasing pressure to launch faster and having multiple product launches all at once, having a tool like this that drives efficiency, uh, productivity, and collaboration is really key to your success. And these three pieces really translate to the age-old triangle of people, process, and technology. And with that framework in mind, here is our launch playbook that we have created, which you know, will continue to evolve with the market and our customers. So we're bucketing our process into three different categories, communications, strategy, and execution. So for communications, our PMM and PM teams work very closely from the very beginning of the roadmap creation process. So at any point in time, we have an idea of what is coming down the pipeline. And once we have a timeline, the first thing we do is start off the communications with an initial planning meeting between our SVP of marketing, head of product marketing like Amit, um, the strategic PMO, and the launch manager, which is often the PMM, um, who actually owns the launch. So for bigger launches, we usually do a brainstorming session with the entire team and then do the planning. The launch manager then works with the individual teams to make sure there are no conflicts and does a brief and kickoff meeting where all of the teams are notified of their tasks. We also have stand-up meetings. We either do that bi-weekly or every day, depending on the need and magnitude of the launch. And the PMO has their own sync meetings with the launch owner to determine what gets added to the next sprint. Uh, they'll provide us with status updates and they'll share information on any roadblocks and any help that they may need to keep things moving forward. For strategy, we like to use a water agile fall approach. We like to have a designated launch manager, which is you know, the PMO who can work with other departments and secure prioritization and resources for our launch. We'll plan and list our resources that will be allocated for this launch. And that'll help us determine specific campaigns and activities that we wanna do. So for example, do we want to do a press release? Do we want to do a dedicated email? What about a dedicated blog post, et cetera? So once this is all decided, it will get incorporated into the different teams backlogs. And the launch manager will actually also work with um, our management team to prioritize or deprioritize for the entire marketing team. So, a lot of marketers know that um, a lot of marketing teams have shared resources like the design team, content, and marketing operations. So it's really important to have that global prioritization across the board to avoid any deadlocks. And also um, within Agile, every team needs to have a globally prioritized list of things that they need to be working on. So we also like to assign a prioritization tier for our launches or t-shirt sizing, if you will. Um, and this is according to the size of the launch. Um, it can depend on the potential impact, revenue opportunities, and um, some other factors as well. So for example, tier one for us would be the most impactful all hands on deck type of launch. Um, whereas a tier four would require the lightest level of effort. So it could be for a very small feature an enhancement release or something to that effect. For execution, we like to initially launch with a minimum viable product or MVP, which then gets absorbed into the train of ongoing marketing sprints for continuous iterations and optimization efforts. 
Now I'm gonna walk you through exactly how our team executes on this launch process that we have just walked through. So in our Rike platform, this, what you see here is our global market space, um, go to market space, which houses everything related to our launches in one place. This is easily accessible by all go to market teams and stakeholders. You can see here the release notifications, um, the release calendar, the go to market plans, roadmap presentations, and more. So what this does is it provides us with a single source of truth and full transparency of all go to market launch activities. So prior to using a CWM like this to track everything in a single unified space, I was spending a lot of time and effort on creating a bunch of spreadsheets with numerous tabs in each spreadsheet. And it was just a constant struggle to piece everything together, update it multiple times a day and stay organized. Uh, plus, I also had to manually share it out constantly to different people who had asked for it at all hours of the day. And this was super time consuming and it just wasn't scalable. So having a digital hub like this makes it really easy to stay organized, updated, and it really provides visibility for everyone that's involved. The best part is that this is a system that our entire organization uses. So everyone knows how to access and click through it. So I don't have to take the time to explain to people how to read a crazy spreadsheet and which areas and tabs to focus on and what the columns and rows mean. So now that you have this central repository for all of your launch activities, I'm gonna walk you through a few simple steps for launching a new product. First, to kick off a new launch, we use our go-to-market um, template that's shown here. So this is a repeatable template that we use over and over again. And we have um, set one up for each t-shirt size for our launches. All we have to do is duplicate this um, and it only takes seconds and immediately all tasks and workflows for a new launch are automatically created. Then we can quickly assign tasks and dates to their owner so everyone knows exactly what they need to do and when they need to do it by. So this really helps us ensure accountability. It shaves off time and manual effort and it prevents things from slipping through the cracks, which is very uh, common when there are a lot of activities involved in a launch. So this also ensures consistency across launches, regardless of the product marketing launch owner. We've probably all built something like this in a spreadsheet at some point, and maybe some of us still do it today. But as I mentioned before, earlier in my career, I did the same. So I built crazy spreadsheets with so many columns and rows, so many tabs, and all kinds of funky formatting. And this method can work well uh, in smaller or slower paced organizations with less frequent and smaller scale launches with limited stakeholders, participants, and activities. But if you have a lot of launches, multiple launches running simultaneously, with each launch having a different level of importance or t-shirt size, needing different types of activities, each activity requiring multi-steps and having subtasks, um, nestled within, it can be super time consuming and very challenging and confusing to put these together in a way that makes sense on spreadsheets. I don't know how many late nights I have spent making myself dizzy and cross-eyed from staring at a spreadsheet, columns and rows, trying to make sense of everything. So having a template like this in a digital CWM platform really speeds up and simplifies the process. Um, Ahmed, I'm, I'm curious to know what your perspective is on this from a product marketing leadership standpoint. I will uh, fully concur with you on everything you said, and especially your point about, you know, preparing for a world of like two launches a year versus 200 launches a year. You know, if you're doing two launches a year, um, that's great. Maybe you're a monopoly uh, and you can, you know, uh, launch a little bit slowly. Uh, these kinds of tools can still help you, you know, scale 
in other ways, especially because if you're a Fortune 50 company, you will probably have offices in Europe and you'll have offices in Asia back and they'll do the same things that your America's team is doing. And often in my experience in the past, you can get into a trap where some regions are following a methodology, but other regions are not and so on. But for the vast majority of us, when we're running marketing teams or product marketing teams, we have to run multiple launches at scale. And I think that one of the best, my favorite things about these templates since I've been using them, um, so on is that uh, they take the guesswork out of your work. So you can focus more on what the right kind of uh, sizing is based on what you're trying to launch. So if you're trying to launch a, uh, you know, a better dropdown, so versus you're trying to launch an accessibility feature versus you're trying to launch an entire new offering for a new vertical. Those are completely different scales. And the best part about these templates is that they give you a canvas to start with where you can then, you don't have to guess, should I do three blog posts or should I do one? And so I'll sort of summarize by saying that the biggest benefit I've seen from a marketing leadership perspective is that you go from doing random acts of launches to systematic you know, launches and you start thinking about launches less as, um, you know, more as a rocket launch to, you know, if you will, or a launch to a different planet where you plan towards it and then you execute it. And even a few months after the launch is not over, it's the only way to maintain that consistency across launches, across teams, across geographies. And if you have multiple partners you work with, or you end up acquiring a company or get acquired, this same template can help you scale there as well. Yeah, this definitely helps us streamline and accelerate everything. Um, so once we have this template and launch structure completed, we then tackle cross-functional communications and alignment. So since our entire organization uses Right, we can communicate and align with all of our cross-functional departments super easily. So we can share um, all of the internal release communications, with our cross-functional teams like sales, customer success, professional services, support, et cetera. So all the right people have the most up-to-date information and are instantly aware of any updates or changes. We have a global team here. So this really helps us simplify time zone and geographical challenges of communicating important information with our distributed counterparts. In the past, I've actually had to manually send out email or Slack messages for internal communications. Plus I had to send out um, additional messages every time there was an update, which happened quite frequently. So it took a lot of time to construct each message and not everyone will see the messages or want to read them in their entirety. So I constantly get pinged with questions that were really time consuming to repeatedly respond to. So communicating with all of your stakeholders and owners on a CWM like this um, really helps provide full visibility and clarity for everyone involved and saves us, the PMM, um, it helps our team, you know, shave off valuable or, or, you know, increase our valuable time to do the million other things that we need to be doing at any given time. And to further alignment uh, and keep launches on track, we also have entire release calendars shared to all the teams. So everyone has the visibility into what's coming down the pipeline. We typically have multiple launches and initiatives simultaneously in the works. So we'll use um, different color coding and layer these calendars together for a single view that clarifies deadlines and dependencies, which makes it super easy to spot scheduling conflicts at a quick note. To ensure consistent on-target delivery, we use our analytics to discover optimization opportunities and also bottlenecks across all levels of our launches in real time. This allows us to connect assets to outcomes, connect outcomes to people, and connect people to assets for three, 
full 360 degree visibility. And this allows us to do a few things. Um, one is to ensure consistent on-target delivery by tracking work progress, team productivity, and performance across all levels of our organization. And it also keeps internal and external stakeholders informed um, with secure and visual executive dashboards that are really easy to consume. And having these real-time reports and data visualizations allow us to assess progress, um, or pivot or even double down on activities at the speed of business. Uh, Amit, you know, what are your thoughts on using analytics to optimize launches and campaigns? I would say one of my, my favorite parts about using uh, workspaces like Rike is that you're able to really connect effort with outcomes. And I love the way you described assets, people and campaigns and how understanding the relationship between all three is really important because then you can, anytime you have to do a new launch, you now know who the right individuals are for that particular launch um, because you can work backwards from the analytics and see that, hey, certain teams tend to launch at a certain velocity. Here's what their completion progress is. Um, you know, here's how they, how they manage this. Um, you know, oftentimes we, we think the effort is enough but product marketing, unlike some of the other functions in marketing, has its additional responsibility that especially because so much of our work is work that then is packaged with other work to be out there in the market. For example, you know, our work from our messaging primers and our persona work and all of our work around stories and narratives is what gets poured into campaigns and into assets, which then go out there and you know, help create a market and such, right? And this is where connecting those analytics with for executives so that a board member can understand it and a C-level individual can understand it really helps um, in uh, you know, ensuring that you get that continued support from those executives. Um, I'll maybe summarize this point before we uh, move towards the end game here with uh, saying that the if you think of marketing as having currency, uh, product marketing is having currency, the whether it's real world currency, the gold or cryptocurrency, right? The value of your currency increases the more people use it. And with analytics, the best part about them is that if you as a marketer can represent your work in these analytics, you're just creating a better currency for executives to consume it. And it just means that more and more people are able to benefit from and influence what you do as product uh, marketing and you know make that function even more strategic. Yep, definitely one of the challenges is proving value as product marketers, even though you know we kind of have our hands in everything. And with that, Amit, could you please help bring everything together for our audience with some takeaways that they can start using right away? Absolutely. You know, I'd say that the first takeaway from us to you is to have an actual GTM launch process and to have it tiered in the same way that engineers have it tiered. This is the first and most important thing that you can do to make sure that you're being ahead of launches rather than being reactive. Once you have that GTM tiered launch process, now as you execute it, well, how can you observe it? That's where tracking progress in real time, and then knowing which activities to double down or not becomes really valuable. So for example, let's say you've planned a series of press releases that are part of your launch because it's a tier one launch. And in the middle of this launch process, some of your competitors announce a competing offering and they start doing their press releases. Well, your GTM launch process should ideally have, through the measurement of these results, enough buffer so that now you can make the necessary pivots to your press releases and maybe do explore other paid promotional activities as a competitive response. And then the third and final point, these processes and the people that manage these processes will have a thousand exemplification or more if you have the right platform. And when we say the word platform, we really mean choosing not just applications that work for you today, 
but that will work for you as you scale and you become five times, 10 times or hundred times bigger. If you're making the investment in those technologies today by not only, um, you know, getting a unified platform or space where all your different cross functional teams can be in to see what's happening with launches, clarify doubts and help scale uh, things forward. Um, you want to invest in a platform that gives you all the workflows that product marketers need and that other marketing team members need and all those who work around marketing uh, from a product uh, or legal or procurement or sales perspective, but also under the hood, invest in a platform that will grow, that's configurable, and ultimately that's really versatile to the needs of your business. If you can bring all these things together in 2021, we are very confident that just like our experience in Reich and with our um, you know, thousands and thousands of customers ranging from, as Swan said earlier, the small universities and nonprofits all the way to the Walmarts of the world, we're very confident that this will set you up for success um, in, this, in this new decade that we're in. And with that, thank you to everyone for joining us today. We really enjoyed sharing the right way of acing your go-to-market strategy in 2021 and beyond in an efficient, effective, and scalable way. As product marketers, we wear so many different hats and every PMM has their own tips and tricks for survival and achieving success in the pivotal roles that we are in. But we do hope that we were able to bring you some new perspectives from our personal playbook and best practices that you can incorporate in your future launches. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop us a note at the email shown here, reich.events at team.reich.com. And thank you again for your attendance. Thank you so much. Amazing product marketing leader doesn't happen by chance. It happens by habit. Product marketing certified leadership has been built on the back of decades worth of experience from some of the world's best known brands with one goal in mind, helping you be the best leader you can be. Crammed with real life case studies, over 12 hours worth of content, templates, exams, and more, this course is everything you need to lead with authority, confidence, influence, and innovation. Every piece of material within the seven modules and 29 chapters has been vetted, tested, and approved by senior level product marketers from companies like Amazon, Uber, and HubSpot, serving up game-changing insights throughout. By the time you've wrapped up the final module, you'll be able to Define what it takes to be a great product marketing leader. Build and scale your team. Understand how to successfully manage your existing team. Use methods for leveraging data. 
Know how to become the voice of the customer. Understand how teams work cross-functionally and improve your strategic thinking. The beauty of the course is you'll have the freedom to work your way through the modules at a pace to suit you. It's 100% self-paced. You'll even get lifetime access to the curriculum, paving the way for refresher sessions forevermore. Visit productmarketingalliance.com to get leadership certified and spearhead your journey to the top. Clue is a competitive enablement platform that collects and delivers intelligence across every department of every business. Clue organizes intel into cards, delivering competitive insights across the tools and devices your teams already use. Enablement teams also get superpowers, allowing them to collect intel from millions of sources outside your organization, as well as internal sources like Salesforce, Slack, and company emails. Clue allows them to go deeper and cover more competitors without any extra hires or late nights for the team. Collect, curate, compete. Clue, competitive enablement for the modern enterprise. Hello and welcome back to the Product Marketing Alliance's Product Marketing Festival 2021. I'm Eric Manser, VP of Product Marketing for Crayon, the title sponsor for this year's event. Coming up next is a presentation that I'm very excited about because it touches on a topic that my company's customers are thinking about all the time, market sizing. Crayon's the established leader in market and competitive intelligence software, and hundreds of enterprise companies use our platform to monitor thousands of their rival companies' ever-changing digital footprints. Some of our customers keep track of five to 10 competitors. Others track hundreds of competitors. And in a lot of instances, the larger the total addressable market, the broader the scope of the potential competition. How do you assess a target market and evaluate new product investments with limited data points and an increasing amount of ambiguity? Well, it's a great question and one that our next presenter has an answer for. Delivering a presentation called Establishing a Market Sizing Framework, TAM, SAM, and What Else, Ma'am? And that's another good title. Please welcome Minerva Tai, a manager of product marketing at Avalara. Thanks for joining me for my session. This is Establishing a Market Sizing Framework. Tam, Sam, and what else, ma'am? My name is Minerva Tai, and I'm a manager in product marketing at Avalara. All right, so first things first. When you hear people talk about market sizing, some acronyms are thrown around, and you might wonder, what's a Tam? Who's Sam? And can somebody please help me? I hope to be the one to be able to do that for you today. So some more background about me. As I had said before, my name is Minerva Tai. I, my pronouns are she, her. And I get really excited when thinking about how to creatively solve big problems using data and gathering interdisciplinary perspectives. My background is varied and it includes product marketing, partner marketing, brand management, copywriting, and graphic design. I've also developed the market sizing framework at Avalara. And if you're keen on Clifton Strengths, my top five are input, learner, intellection, individualization, and achiever. Let's dive in. Definitions. TAM, while it is also a hat, in this context, it stands for a total addressable market. This is the overall revenue opportunity that's available to a product or a service if 100% of initial target market and follow-on markets is achieved. It's gonna answer that question, 
you know, if we captured 100% of the market, how much money could we make? Sam, not a person, could be a person, you know. In this case, it's the serviceable addressable market. This is a segment of TAM whose needs are relevant to the product's value propositions and are within the geographical or technological reach of your business. Knowing Sam answers the question, what is the monetary value of the market within our reach? And then SOM is a serviceable, obtainable market. This is a subset of SAM that is the realistic market share your business can capture the distribution channels and resources available to you. This is gonna help you answer the question, what is the monetary value of the share of market within our immediate reach? Why do each of these matter? Each component of market sizing really serves a different purpose, but all together, they're gonna to help your business switch strategy from ideation and discovery to getting a product into market and measuring that success. As a product marketer, your ability to analyze all of these elements will position you as the expert of your market. If you're thinking about TAM, understanding TAM is going to give you the insights into the potential upper bound of the market and help you prioritize the investment of resources and funding for product development. Knowing TAM is going to help you make business decisions because it's going to help you guide whether or not this launch is going to be big or small, is the market worth it? Um, and think about some iterative improvements to your business. Understanding SAM is gonna give you insight into how and where to go to market because you're considering the external factors that you can actually seek to overcome over time as your product develops. It's going to help you make go-to-market decisions and Coming down from TAM, the sizing typically decreases, but the precision and utility of the information increase. And then SOM, that's going to give you insight into the potential success when going to market with what you have. With all these pieces, you know what they are now. Why do you need a framework? Well, to effectively allocate investments and resources, you need accurate and realistic assessments of your market size and a consistent approach to doing such analyses, especially if you're going to be doing many different projects around market sizing for the same business. That framework is going to help you with consistency. Because ultimately for market sizing, the math truly is simple. It's just the number of customers multiplied by money. However, the process itself, it's not simple. You're gonna to have to consider a couple of things, which are which market is in scope, which data do you use, and why have you made certain assumptions? We're gonna dig into each of these elements. So let's start with what market do we want? This is about scoping. Essentially, you need to know and determine what is the question that you are trying to answer and define it. Some considerations here as you're thinking about this and building out your framework. You have to think about what are the factors you'll always want to know for every sizing to make sure that there's consistency. Now, are there finite limitations to your market? Are you going to need to frame this in any hierarchical way so you can answer future questions in a similar fashion? And what data are you going to need in order to answer this question? Now, this session is not all theoretical. We're gonna put each element into practice through an example that carries throughout. So let's pretend I am a company with a product called Choosy Choose, and I wanna size my market. Um, by the way, I, I don't know if Choosy Choose is a real product or not, but if it is, I'm not talking about the one that one. These numbers are made up, the product is made up. Uh, what's not made up, are the dogs that you'll see throughout this presentation. This is kind of an excuse for me to share photos of my rescues, Atticus and Audrey. And uh, hope you think they're cute. I think that they are. And uh, you'll see a little bit more from them throughout this presentation. So yeah, let's get back to the topic of choosy choose. We were just talking about scoping and how that first step to take is knowing what question I want answered. So, so my question here is gonna be, it's gonna sound kind of simple, which is what is the market size for choosy choose in the US? Now, 
simple sounding question, but I have to really think, how am I going to get there? I have to consider factors for my TAM and SAM. And in this case, my TAM bounds are going to be that I think my market is US-based businesses that are B2C, they're boutique retail pet stores. And my SAM bounds will require that these pet stores carry uh, dog treats and that they have regular considerations for adding new products. And then we're just, you know, to keep it simple, we're going to pretend that I don't have any distribution issues and I can still service uh, the entire United States. So there are plenty of other, fa other factors you can take into consideration as you develop your framework. And each of these that I'm going to show are ways to get more granular per component. And you will want to get more granular because you want to get more accurate as you go from TAM to SAM to SOM. So for TAM, things that you can think about, the products, services, and ecosystems that you are going after, the geographies, the type of customers, you know, are they businesses or are they individual consumers? If you're targeting businesses, are they B2B, B2C, both? If you're targeting individual consumers, what are their demographics? Maybe you have a business or you are working for a company where individuals of a certain age group matter to you or a certain um, economic level. A couple of things you can be thinking about there. You'll also want to consider industry restrictions, you know, who really is your customer? And then also, how do you segment? Are you going after what you consider a small business, enterprise, mid-market? I don't know. There are different ways that you can segment. For Sam, this is, if you recall, uh, going to depend on factors that are within your control when it comes to servicing the market. So if there are particular geographical restrictions for you, like you can't you know, get to certain regions, that could be something that shaves down your market when you're considering SAM. Are there regulatory restrictions that make it difficult for your company to uh, distribute to your market? What about industries and demographics, demographics that uh, you can't readily serve or can? Do you have the technology? Are there psychographic or cultural behaviors you need to consider? Pricing tolerance, maybe? And then if you get to SOM, which was the serviceable obtainable market, which refers to, you know, if, if you're thinking about what are the resources and channels, channels available to you, you might then take into consideration your databases, your um, different sales and marketing channels, market growth rates, campaign conversion rates, you know, your historic performance, essentially, competitors and competitive responses. You can't expect that when you launch a product that your competitors aren't going to have some sort of, you know, reaction to, to what you released. Maybe they even come out with a competitive product. And even sales team capacity can come into effect. You know, if your sales team, if your sales force is not large enough to do the uh, volume of sales that you're hoping for, you need to take that into consideration. And again, all of these are examples. Your framework should outline which will be applicable to your business. So if you're really establishing a framework that you can use that's repeatable and consistent, you should be able to say, well, X, Y, Z are the factors we'll use every time we scope a market sizing product project. So in my example earlier, I had chosen to address geography, customer type, industry, and a segment when it came to my TAM. So next up, which is the data that we use? This is about sourcing. You'll want to understand which data sources are reliable and then be able to defend why you'll use them. So some things to consider are the integrity and the accessibility of the information. And when I say integrity, I do mean, are you confident that this is good data? And if someone wanted to check your work, could they access it later? What about the methodology for data collection? You know, would you have more trust in a report that looked at 5,000 businesses and their responses or an individual survey of five people? You might want to go with the, uh, the one that has a bigger sample size or one that is statistically significant. And then recency and update frequency, something to think about. 
If you're working with a vendor who only updates their information every 10 years, and you're working in an industry that is very fast paced, that's probably not the source for the information that you need. And then what are the assumptions that you'll need to make to fill the gaps? So if we go back to choosy choose, remember again, the math is simple. It's number of customers times money. So in my example here, I've considered many options and I actually decided that the US census information, the latest of which is from 2017, is gonna be my best bet for locating the number of customers. So I have thought about this data sources defensibility, its accessibility and its methodology to make my decision. And I've decided that I only plan on selling directly to pet stores rather than broadly to any other type of businesses. So this actually helps me because the source that I chose uh, specifically identifies that pets, uh, pet and pet supply stores are uh, indicated by NAICS code 453910. And what that is in reference to is uh, the North American Industry Classification System, which is a standard way to classify businesses from a federal statistics standpoint. And they've called out pet and pet supply stores. Uh, they've also, in this data set, indicated um, what number of firms have what number of employees within certain bands. And so if I were to think that my boutique pet stores have less than five employees, and I look at my census data, it tells me that there are 2,696 businesses with less than five employees within that next code. So I've got my number of potential customers now. For money, I'm gonna use internal data for average sales price. So I'm gonna expect my customers are going to buy $2,500 worth of choosy choose per year. Um, we're going to keep it simple for this, this exercise. I don't know if that's true, but let's pretend it is. You may choose a different measure of money depending on your business model, though, as, as you're building out your framework. So if you are, let's say, SaaS based, uh, you might want to think about annual recurring revenue or ARR as the more accurate approach here. So keep that in mind when you build your framework, like what is the measure of money that's important to me? So here are some potential data sources to consider both internally and externally. Um, and, and if you're looking at these, you're, you're probably thinking, when might you use each? Well, you might leverage internal data when you're exploring existing products and, and markets. Um, there's some information you can gather from your, your customer firmographics and demographics or their revenue, or your pricing structure, campaign performance, sales performance, your own product and BI dashboards, and even any primary research you've done. Those are all potential sources of information for you to use in your exercises. Now, when you're exploring new markets and new products, you may rely on external data instead, which means you could be digging into statistics from nat national agencies or top analyst firms, you might also find use in information from industry specific publications and reports. And if you're going to be sizing things that, you know, markets that are new to you and for new products, it could be pretty difficult. But you can also look around and see what competitive information you can find from existing vendors who are serving that market with a similar product. And in, in any situation, the, the data is not going to be perfect and uh, any gaps are definitely gonna to need to be filled with some assumptions, which is where we're going next. If you're gonna be covering those gaps, why these assumptions? So this is a little bit of surmising mixed with some hopefully rational conclusions. You'll want to decide on which assumptions to make and then declare them up front so that anyone who's looking at your market sizing understands why you made these assumptions and what they are. So some, some, some considerations. The defensibility of your claims, you know, declaring it as one thing, but also just make sure that you have some citations or some place where you list these assumptions so that th you can defend them later on. And this actually can also be helpful if you do a market sizing, let's say at the very beginning of, uh, of a product launch, 
um, you know, during the ideation or discovery period. And then maybe it's months again, uh, months before you go back to it again, you'll was want to know what assumptions you made when you made these calculations. Uh, if you were using any industry benchmarks to help you make these assumptions, make sure that uh, you indicate these as well as their sources. Um, you may make some assumptions based on behaviors that have been observed internally or externally. Uh, maybe some assumptions have been made due to primary and secondary research you've done. In all cases, make sure that they are all things that you can uh, declare and defend. And then there may also just be some underlying assumptions that are unique to your business that can carry over into your framework. You know, hey, in every situation where I'm doing a market sizing, because our business does this, we, we will always assume this in all cases. You know, you know what's, uh, you, you know what applies to your business best. Okay, so if I had done some research on Choosy Choose, I might have uncovered a few things on which I'll base my assumptions. So let's say I interviewed customers and I found that only 33% of them consider adding new product lines annually. And then I, I looked around and I found a credible industry report that indicates only 5% of stores don't sell dog treats. Now, did I interview every possible pet store? Nope. And did the report survey every possible pet store? It's doubtful. However, we do need to make these assumptions. So here we will. We're gonna assume for our TAM purposes that a boutique pet store means that they have less than five employees. Um, I actually made this assumption earlier when I was looking through how do I you know, find which, um, which number to use for my number of customers in my data source. Um, and then we're gonna assume that they all will buy Choosy Choose. For our SAM purposes, we're going to consider this, you know, behavioral findings, and we're going to assume that these research findings are going to apply across my market. With all those in mind, where this brings us to our calculations based on everything we discussed. And remember, this is an incredibly basic example. Your situation could easily be more complex. However, having a framework will really help simplify it. OK, Tam, remember, calculations, number of customers times money. With TAM, that was simple. Uh, it really is just the number of customers that I found from my data source, which is the US Census data on pet and pet supply stores, times the $2,500 that I believe I will be charging my customers. So it brings us to a TAM of $6,740,000. Great. Let's get a little bit more specific when we get down to SAM. Now, my customer count is going to change a little bit because I've made some assumptions here that based on my research that, you know, 95% of these businesses sell dog treats. And then of those, 33% are willing to consider new products. So all those together equal my number of customers. And we're still going to sell to them at $2,500. So that takes my SAM to $2,112,990. And then... Let's jump into SOM, a little different here. And here's why, SOM is going to rely on the channels and resources available to you. And if my resources, you know, I've, I've considered the parameters in TAM and SAM and defining who my market is, but my database only gives me a certain number of businesses that fit that mold, I may start with a different number here for my number of customers in my equation. So. I only found 200 in my database. And when I typically market to my, you know, my, my database, I only get about a 5% win rate. So we're gonna assume that here. And then we're gonna also assume that in year one, I actually discount how much I sell to these because it's, it's my first year, uh, first year of the product. So we're selling them at $2,000. This actually comes out to a sum of $20,000. And since this is looking at year one, let's add in year two. Year two, we think about that 200, uh, that number of 200 businesses, and we know from our information that the market growth grows, or the market grows at 3%. And then we're also going to still consider that 5% win rate when I do campaigns. We're going to multiply that by the full price now because we're in year two. So multiply by $2,500 leads me to a sum in year two of $25,750. 
So you can see how it gets more complex with the more factors we uh, consider and how much more information we have. And in your case, as you're establishing a framework, knowing which of these is important is going to be key for you. So all these numbers, let's look at it visually. Uh, the, the circles aren't exactly proportionally represented since the SOM bubble that would be nearly non-existent compared to you know, TAM and SAM, but you get the picture. Each level of specificity is going to really narrow your market further, but it's going to increase your accuracy in order to guide the strategy about your market. Now, considering everything that we covered, how good is the framework if you don't build a practice around using it? Let's think about how do we build a process. You know, This is about scaling now. You're going to want to use the framework to help with market sizing, which then helps with planning and decision making, and then distribute the necessary information about the process. So what's that process? First, identify which factors are relevant to your business. Then create that standard framework. Establish a timing on when market sizing happens. So you may say, we do TAMs and SAMs at the beginning of our planning to see, to see if a project is worth pursuing. And then we do SOM later when we have a better sense of our go-to-market strategy and you know what are the ways that we can tweak that strategy to have a more favorable outcome. You're going to build an intake process and ensure that there is resourcing for it, as in there's someone on the receiving end of the intake process who can actually do you know, the market sizing. Could be you. You're going to socialize this framework to make sure everyone understands what the framework is and what all the definitions are as they are as they pertain to your business. And then you're going to use the results to guide decision making. So this is important because this is going to really put you in that spot where you are the expert of the market. So let's summarize the pieces needed to establish a market sizing framework. One, which factors will you use to define scope? Two, which data sources are valid to your business? Three, which assumptions can you make that are sound? And four, how do you plan on sustaining that process? Well, I hope this was informative and that you learned something today that will prove useful in your product marketing career. If you need to contact me, find me on LinkedIn and Twitter. Though, if you wanna see more dog pictures, I'd recommend following me on Twitter and instead of LinkedIn. Uh, thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the Product Marketing Fest. Thanks. Hey everyone, I'm Brie Bunzel coming to you live from Sydney, Australia. I'm currently the customer marketing lead for Dropbox and I'm so excited to be part of the PMM Festival. Over the course of my career, I've had experience in PMM brand marketing, field marketing, and now focused on all things customer marketing. I'm excited to share more about my new customer advisory board masterclass. I learned about the importance of customer centricity at a young age of seven when I didn't have the right audience, messaging, positioning, and pricing in mind for my neighborhood lemonade stand. My market researcher father was not impressed with the poorly located stand, undervalued 10 cents cup of lemonade, and it was there that I began my 101 lesson on understanding customers. Since then, I've had the chance to work for a lot of incredible customer-centric companies, learning the frameworks and the value of customer visits, experiences and events that fuel feedback loops and drive the overall company strategy. My team and I at Dropbox built the first customer advisory board program globally, and I've created a blueprint for running a successful cab, all taught in this new cab masterclass. Cabs are an essential part and component of shaping your strategic framework for not only your product, but also your overall company strategy. 
This course will also help you understand the strategic benefits of a cab, help you get business buy-in from stakeholders, and provide the right templates and guidelines to build a better customer advisory board experience for your customers. You'll have a chance to learn best practices to drive engagement among your members, both virtual as well as in person, and you'll learn how to best incorporate those customer insights into your company feedback loops. You'll hear from cab experts at Asana, Adobe, Zendesk, LinkedIn, and the Product Marketing Alliance. It'll be filled with three hours of content, 13 chapters, three exclusive templates, and an official Brands Make a New certification to seal the deal. I hope to see you there. It's been a pretty intriguing and informative day so far, and we're so excited you're here attending the 2021 PMA Product Marketing Festival. I'm Eric Manser, VP of Product Marketing at Crayon, and your host for day two of this epic event. Crayon's the title sponsor for this year's PMM Festival, and we've had a long-standing relationship with the Product Marketing Alliance. Our customers, many of them PMA members, rely on our software to track and analyze competitive intelligence data and then activate that intel throughout their organization. Delivering high quality battle cards to your frontline account executives is one great use case for competitive intel, but it certainly isn't the only one. What about helping your customer success team fend off rivals who are trying to steal your customers? How about making sure your executive team is well equipped to make key strategic decisions based on what your competitors are doing or not doing? And is there a way you can deliver key pieces of competitive intelligence to your product marketing team who's in charge of crafting a go-to-market strategy? Only with Crayon is the answer to all three of those questions a resounding, yes, you can. Speaking of go-to-market strategy, the title of this next presentation gets right to the point. Coming up next, Adobe's principal product marketer for customer journey management solutions, Bruce Swan, brings you go-to-market strategy and nailing your product launch. Hello, and welcome to the Product Marketing Alliance Product Marketing Festival. My name is Bruce Swan, Principal Product Marketing Manager at Adobe, as well as PMA Ambassador, and thank you for joining today's session, where I will give you ideas and inspiration for a product go-to-market strategy and how to nail your product launch. In this session, I will highlight a few challenges that I'm sure we can all relate to, then dig right into best practices and considerations for nailing a product launch. I will also share tools that you can use now to support your product launches, 
and I will, of course, share my contact information at the end of this session so we can continue the conversation. So let's dig right in. I love how the PMA defines PMM as the driving force behind getting products to market and keeping them there. And that is what a product launch is all about, getting products to market and gaining momentum to keep them there. Your plan should be a step-by-step -step plan created to successfully launch a product to market. It should identify a market problem and position the product as a solution. Your plan should include the definition of a target audience and key personas, clear messaging, and a strategy to help gain momentum both in the market as well as with your sales team. Ideally, your strategy heightens awareness in the market, creates momentum, and ensures you don't waste a ton of money and resources releasing a product to the market that just isn't ready to be understood by the market, ready to be sold, and most importantly, isn't ready to be used by your customers. In our session today, I will get into some of the key building blocks necessary for a successful launch, marketing and managing a launch, messaging and positioning, identifying your target audience and key personas you need your field to talk to, build your relationships with, and ideally sell to. But there are challenges, challenges with both internal and external pressures to do things at an accelerated pace, or in today's world, virtually and not as connected to your team as you want to be, as well as the usual pressures on any product marketer. It can be a double-edged sword as a PMM. I love wearing many hats, but at the same time, you can easily get overwhelmed and pulled in many different directions. And lastly, there are of course challenges with staying within a budget as well as staying ahead of the competition. But if you can overcome these challenges, there are many benefits for your organization where you can gain efficiencies, reduce the time it takes to get a product to market, reduce the financial risk of a failed launch, and delivers the best experience to customers. Ideally, your plan can be a template for future launches, which can only help. But if you can overcome these challenges, there are many benefits for your organization where you can gain efficiencies, reduce the time it takes to get a product to market, reduce the financial risk of a failed launch, and delivers the best experience to customers. Ideally, your plan can be a template for future launches, which can only help. And to help you nail your launch and achieve the benefits of a successful launch, I will cover four things. Preparation, clarity of messaging, defining outcomes, and assessing product launch readiness. First, let's talk about preparation. When I'm thinking about a launch, there are many things to consider, but I never leave out these four. First, define the business issue. What problems does your product solve and what are the expected benefits or what is the value? Internal alignment, are all the internal stakeholders aligned on messaging and goals, but also the step it takes to launch a product and how you will measure success across stakeholders and teams. Timing, is the launch timed with a customer event or company milestone, which makes it easy to amplify a message? And lastly, personas, who is experiencing the problem that your product solves? What are the pain points and frustrations that you can alleviate? I'm going to dig into this last point a bit more in detail and share with you tools I use quite frequently. A logical way to define a persona is to think through who you are selling to. According to the Harvard Business Review, on average, there are nearly seven people in every organization making purchase decisions for a single sale. These people make up the buying center. Here are just a few personas in a buying center I can relate to with technology products that's similar to what we offer here at Adobe. There's the vision leader, the strategist or leader desiring to do something different, to drive the business. The decision maker, ultimately the person making the go or no-go decision. The feature evaluator or practitioner, and of course compliance or IT, who typically plays a big role in any technology decision. While these apply to Adobe and technology companies, you should think through your personas and are they a part of a team or a buying center? 
This is quite a bit of detail, but a useful tool to break down what the personas are interested in at various stages of the buying cycle using the examples I just shared. I'll focus in on one, the vision leader. When they navigate through the buying process, their needs might evolve. Initially, it might be, what new tech do I need to be aware of to help drive business objectives? But later, the needs could evolve to, how do I build a business case? I would encourage you to build out a similar tool to help you with your personas and map their needs to various stages of the sales cycle. And here's another way of looking at it. We know that while a marketing funnel is a good illustration of a buying process, it is far from reality. The buyer or buyers are on a journey where they can engage with a brand whenever and however they want through many different channels. One of your personas might be engaged early or maybe later in the buying process. But where I'm going with this, as you build out your launch plan, which ties in a content plan for how you create momentum, interest, and buzz in the marketplace, you need to consider content aligned not only with persona, but the buying stage. And here's just one simple example, tying in the personas I covered, buying stage, and content that they might be interested in. I would encourage you to map out a content plan like this aligned by persona, sales stage, and content. It helps you align your messaging to personas and where they are in the buying process. Next, let's talk about clarity. When developing a go-to-market strategy, it is extremely important to have your brand standards identified. This includes everything from your mission statement, messaging, goals, and even down to your font standards. Messaging should be clear, succinct, and free of jargon, which definitely takes some work, but we all have to do it. There should also be internal alignment, so everyone is on the same page or singing from the same sheet music. And lastly, authenticity. Buyers are looking for authentic connections and searching for companies that understand them rather than those that push the customer to simply buy into the company's perspectives or narratives. Let's first talk messaging. It's critical to a launch, and rightfully so, because it's where we spend an incredible amount of time, in addition, of course, to managing launches. A tool I use is a message house. This is a little old school, but so incredibly helpful to help you frame how you want to message your product or solution. This framework is very straightforward. There is an umbrella message at the top, something like changing the world through digital experiences, then get into the pillars where you succinctly convey the usefulness of your solutions, like making lives easier, and giving confidence, statements like used by a hundred companies or a thousand marketers across the globe, and what you need your audience to do. Lastly, backing it up with value drivers or proof points, such as XYZ company saw a 25% increase in lift or an increase in marketing ROI. Here is a slightly tailored version, which I often use, where you start with a succinct description of the core audiences for the product or services you're launching and how this product should be viewed by its customers. Then a brief statement that articulates what you want the customer to take away from you, then several features of your offering, followed by benefits. I would encourage you to at least start with this framework, then evolve it to your needs. Once you define the messaging for launch, Stick to it. It helps get everybody aligned, but it also helps you be consistent throughout and wherever and whenever the messaging is used, whether it be blog posts, press interviews, analyst conversations, product collateral, and sales presentations. And you can definitely streamline content creation in doing so because you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Here's one more useful tool, which brings together the personas we talked about earlier with messaging. In particular, the value statements or benefits in your messaging, which drives so much. For example, unique statements for the visionary or C-level executive, unique statements for the decision maker, and the same for practitioners. This helps with very targeted messaging by persona, which can help accelerate your sales cycles, as well as getting your buyers within an organization in alignment. Last point regarding clarity is to be authentic with your messaging. And a good way to do that is through storytelling. Storytelling sells and helps you go beyond jargon or sales pitches. 
Storytelling resonates, storytelling connects. For marketers, stories are a way to be authentic, a way to connect, resonate with customers, create emotion, build trust, convey brand value, and emphasize the timing of a message or an announcement, all of which builds loyalty and turns your customers into storytellers themselves through brand advocacy. I'll walk you through an example of making moments matter and where you can be authentic at different points in the customer journey. So for example, early on, you can raise awareness, make a connection, encourage research, which can help making that initial connection or timing that might elicit a response. Or during the consideration stage, promoting a specific product, showcasing a product demo, sharing a peer review, this can lend to trust, brand authenticity, and emotion. And in the decision phase, highlight a product promotion. Create a sense of urgency by highlighting the need for change, the need for change now, or showcase value drivers, all of which can lend to emotion, making a connection, but also considering the timing of a message based on a call to a rep or a visit to a website. Lastly, in the nurture phase is where you want to build a relationship. You can encourage feedback, start a conversation, and provide updates, which revolts in social activity, loyalty, and creating further brand awareness. Next, outcomes. At the heart of any launch is defining measurable outcomes. And there are three key aspects, defining launch goals and KPIs, ensuring that they are measurable, which more than anything, serve as a great way to celebrate wins, where you can learn and gain momentum for your next launch, and defining goals for all of your stakeholders and ensuring they have KPIs as well. When I think of goals for a launch, I think of the overall PMM measures of success. And thankfully, the PMA does a great job of defining that for us. Goals like new revenue, qualified leads, upsells, customer retention, or increased sales qualified leads. But then take it down a level and get specific. Set goals for yourself like being on time with del deliverables, driving customer engagement with emails or social activities or participation in a webinar, driving revenue, driving growth, adding subscribers and readiness. Again, take this down a level, make it unique to your organization and your launch and measure them for different stakeholders along the way. And speaking of that, something else that is critical is ensuring alignment. And that is making sure that everybody is on the same page. Start by listing any and all stakeholders, which you could then put into a plan. Stakeholders like product marketing, product management, the person who handles press and analyst relationships, your marketing teams, enablement teams, demand gen, and so on, but also teams that you might rely on in other parts of the world. Then for each stakeholder, build out a plan with timelines but also with KPIs for each stakeholder. This helps measure your desired outcomes and keeps everybody aligned. Here is a simple example. You can manage this by spreadsheet, but I would highly recommend you using a tool like monday.com, Asana, or Workfront. And lastly, and perhaps most important, readiness. During your launch process or project, you need to continually assess readiness. Ask yourself and ask your stakeholders, is your organization ready to support a launch? Is sales ready to sell, message, and position your product? And most importantly, will your customers be ready to adopt your product or services? I've covered quite a bit, but let's do a quick review on how you can nail your next product launch. First, preparation. Define the business issue. What problems does your product solve and what are the expected benefits or what is the value? Have that well documented and available to all internal stakeholders. Internal alignment. Ensure all internal stakeholders are aligned on messaging and goals, but also the steps it takes to launch a product and how you will measure success across the different stakeholders and teams. Thirdly, timing. Can you time the launch with a customer event or company milestone, which makes it easier to amplify a message? And lastly, personas. Define who is experiencing the problem that your product or services solves. 
What are the pain points and frustrations that you can alleviate? And I showed you different tools for how you can define personas, map their interests with where they are in the journey, and what content might get their attention. Next, clarity. Ensuring brand standards, including everything from your mission statement, messaging, and goals, and even down to your font or color standards. Messaging should be clear and succinct and free of jargon. Challenge yourself on that. There should also be internal alignment, so everyone is on the same page or singing from the same sheet music. And lastly, authenticity. Buyers are looking for authentic connections and want to go beyond a company's perspectives or narratives. I shared a couple of different tools to consider when authenticity can come into play. Outcomes. Defining measurable outcomes. Defining launch goals and KPIs and ensuring they are measurable. And defining goals for all of your launch stakeholders and ensuring they have KPIs as well. And lastly, and perhaps most important, readiness. During your launch process or project, you need to continually assess readiness. Is your organization ready to support a launch? Is sales ready to sell, message, and position your product? Is your company ready to support the product or services? And most importantly, is your customer ready to adopt your product or services? Well, that concludes this session. I hope I gave you ideas and inspiration for a go-to-market strategy for your product and how to nail your product launch. I'd love to keep in touch. My contact information is below, so let's continue the conversation. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the Product Marketing Festival. Have a wonderful day. amazing product marketing leader doesn't happen by chance. It happens by habit. Product marketing certified leadership has been built on the back of decades worth of experience from some of the world's best known brands with one goal in mind, helping you be the best leader you can be. Crammed with real life case studies, over 12 hours worth of content, templates, exams and more, this course is everything you need to lead with authority, confidence, influence, and innovation. Every piece of material within the seven modules and 29 chapters has been vetted, tested, and approved by senior level product marketers from companies like Amazon, Uber, and HubSpot 
serving up game-changing insights throughout. By the time you've wrapped up the final module, you'll be able to define what it takes to be a great product marketing leader, build and scale your team, understand how to successfully manage your existing team, use methods for leveraging data, know how to become the voice of the customer, understand how teams work cross-functionally, and improve your strategic thinking. The beauty of the course is you'll have the freedom to work your way through the modules at a pace to suit you. It's 100% self-paced. You'll even get lifetime access to the curriculum, paving the way for refresher sessions forevermore. Visit productmarketingalliance.com to get leadership certified and spearhead your journey to the top. Do you have the creative brief? Go fish! Do you have the project's deadline? Go fish. Take back control of work. Reich helps your team work as one. Got it! Hello, PMM Festival. I'm Eric Manser, VP of Product Marketing at Crayon and your host for the day's festivities. The Product Marketing Alliance is the amazing industry organization who puts on this event, and my company, Crayon, is proud to be this year's title sponsor. The PMA has grown into a global community of product marketers, and we view our relationship to this community to be an incredibly important one. As more and more product marketers find competitive intelligence gathering and dissemination to be part of their job description, we want to make sure that they know that Crayon, the undisputed industry leader in CI software, has their backs. Crayon literally created this category of competitive intelligence software, and almost eight years on from our founding, the market's a growing one. But with the exception of food delivery services, no enterprise market grew as fast and as big during the COVID-19 lockdowns than education technology. It's the focus of our next presentation, and it's sure to be an intriguing look inside a high-growth industry that's showing zero signs of slowing down. From Chad Miros, a product marketing manager for Clever Inc., Here's his presentation entitled, Navigating the School Ecosystem, Cross-Collaboration for Go-To-Market Success. Welcome everyone, my name is Chad Myros and this is Navigating the School Ecosystem, Cross-Collaboration for GTM Success. The agenda for today's talk, I will give an introduction on who I am and where I work. I will also create the context of marketing and ed tech in 2021 for those of you who are joining that do not work in ed tech. I'll also share what it's like to work cross-functionally with stakeholders during the GTM process. Um, really tie in how product marketing gathers the pieces and puts them together for successful GTM launches, and also share my own personal tips and best practices for successful launches. And so, as I said, my name is Chad Myros. I'm the product marketing manager responsible for teachers, STLs, and Clever Messaging at Clever Inc. Um, STL stands for school tech leads, and you can think of them as the key decision makers for implementing technology at schools. And so, what is Clever? It's the portal that students and teachers use daily. Clever allows students who have already logged into Clever access across multiple applications for learning without needing to memorize multiple usernames and passwords. And in fact, we're used in 65% of US K-12 schools right now. And so a little bit about myself. I currently work at Clever Inc. leading teacher and school tech lead experiences on Clever. I've worked in ed tech for a while. Prior to working at Clever, I worked at Quizlet and Coursera. I actually started my professional career in the education sector. 
I taught high school English for five years, and I did my graduate degree in education, emphasis in teaching and learning, and also my teaching credential in 2012. And so a little bit of the context for this talk um, and why I thought it was important to share insights into marketing for those of us in ed tech is that ed tech in 2021 is going to be a very different scene than what it has been in previous years. Because of 2020 and the COVID-19 pandemic, schools, teachers, families, students, everyone had to learn in a new way. And more importantly, teachers had to learn how to teach in a new way without training and without support. And so a little bit of the landscape right now, you can see on this slide, I've just taken several various screenshots of articles that are out right now, really highlighting that this next school year is gonna be so different in comparison to everything in the past. And teachers are coming out of a school year that was extremely different. And so something that I thought was interesting on the bottom left hand side of the screen, you can see an op ed piece from Education Weekly that is getting ed tech wrong would be a bitter pandemic legacy. So no pressure on any of us that are out here marketing and working in ed tech. And so right now I see three key challenges for marketing in ed tech and particularly reaching teachers and that's the audience that I'm most responsible for and the teachers that I need to speak to and the audience that we really want to target with adopting clever and getting their students and families and everyone bought into using the product. And so one, I would say is oversaturation. Every technology tried to solve the problems of our schools, teachers, students, and families. Summer of 2020 is typically known as back to school season where uh, ed tech companies are trying to get right in front of schools and districts and teachers. And last year, there was just a plethora of tools and ways to use them in the classroom to make up for the lack of in-person teaching. Number two, I would say that there's a lot of adopted products from 2020. Districts and schools signed contracts and purchased technology quickly in 2020. And a lot of those contracts carry over beyond just one school year. So even though teachers might be looking for a new technology or a new tool, because of prior 2020 contracts and um, purchases, they can't use a tool. So that's, again, market share that we're losing. And then three, burnout. Teaching through a pandemic and virtual learning was rough. Teachers, students, and families are burnt out. So right now, as we're going into summer, I would say the teachers are not as interested, schools, families, students, in learning more about what they can do for the next school year when they just want to take a break and relax from the last school year that they were just in. And so how do we reach teachers with these big three problems? The school ecosystem, the way that we view it here at Clever, is that you have districts, teachers, and families. And I put it in this diagram because you can't reach families without reaching teachers, and you can't reach teachers without reaching districts. And for me, when we're launching products at Clever, particularly for teachers, there's a huge ecosystem of different audiences and different channels, and also different stakeholders across the different audiences. And so one thing to keep in mind though, is all of the audiences are working towards unlocking new ways to learn for all students. So we do at least have one common goal in this plethora mix chaotic matrix of trying to get different products and different stakeholders bought in. And so the cross-functional teams that I work with across district teachers and families include product managers, growth marketing, designers, engineers, and customer success teams on the district vertical. Then on the teacher side, there's myself in addition to product managers, growth marketing managers, designers, and engineers. And then finally, on the families vertical, again, product managers, growth marketing, designers, and engineers. So there's multiple teams across multiple audiences all working together to get our teachers on board to using products. And that's kind of where I come in, is how do I get all of these different cross-functional stakeholders to align? And so that's the question that I always take into all of my cross-functional meetings and product launches is, how do we make sense of all the competing priorities and needs? And that's product marketing. That's exactly what this role is and why I enjoy product marketing. And it's really bringing together all of diff the different stakeholders and trying to make sense of everything and launch successful products. And so personally, I feel that product marketers are the storytellers of the product that tie every stakeholder to a common mission and goal. And a slide that I saw from 
a senior marketing manager at podcast at HubSpot. And I, I was looking online is, is this quote right here. It really sticks out to me is nothing sticks in your head better than a story. Stories can express the most complicated ideas in the most digestible ways. And I think that's the key to product marketing success when you're collaborating across various stakeholders holders is just a strong story. And so I'm going to give a product example. And that example is Clever Messaging. And this is a new product that Clever is recently revamping and it's going to launch this summer in summer 2020, 21, I'm sorry. This is a new product that is going to launch in summer 2021. No, this is a revamped product that is going to relaunch. No, I'm sorry, you have to edit all this out. But this is a product that is going to launch in summer 2021. And so the responsibilities of myself, the product marketing manager, is one, to identify product market fit, two, to complete user research, three, develop product positioning, four, message testing, as well as other prototype testing with our users and making sure that they're aligned, developing sales enablement, objection handling materials, as well as customer success training, and then the heart of the launch, the go-to-market plan. And so I wanted to give a little bit of an outline of the processes that I use to get my cross-functional stakeholders aligned and also position myself as the product marketing manager to really tell the story and own it and really drive product development and influence the roadmap as well as designs. And so I start off with the cross-functional kickoff and I align with cross-functional stakeholders on corporate goals, team goals, and the ideal vision for the product in the market, right? And so when it came to clever messaging, really just brainstorming, what is it that we hope a clever messaging product can do for our users and for our overarching product and business? From there, when I left that meeting as the product marketing manager, I really leaned into user research, right? Everyone has an opinion on what should be built and why. And this is the opportunity for the PMMs to really hear what users need, would like, and what are they currently using? This data will be the crux for positioning and targeting, in my personal opinion. From there, after doing some of the research, I like to work closely with my growth marketing manager. And based on the findings from user research and that sort of qualitative and quantitative data, we ran channel tests on positioning, value props, and fulfillment of user needs. And the results here really helped ground and shape the future GTM strategies. So, the user research and the testing with growth marketing really set up the product marketing manager to understand the audience, the marketing, and really the story that they're going to tell the users and the share. And so from there, after you've had the user research and the testing, and you've really been able to develop your understanding of the story, I like to call another cross-functional share out. And so as product teams continue to refine the roadmap and meet milestones, research and testing can drastically influence prioritization for product stickiness. And likewise, design can refine the UX to drive adoption. And last but not least, after all of those processes come together, we have the go to market, piecing the story together. Throughout the product planning and marketing testing phase, PMMs have gained insights into what will best stick with users. This part of the process, PMMs lead in insights and advocate for a plan that will best suit users. And here's a little bit of a timeline. Like I said, I had mentioned earlier for ed tech, back to school, the summer, really July, August, September is September, July, August, and September is really the key moments for getting in front of teachers and marketing to schools, districts, ed tech leaders, et cetera. And so here's a sample plan. This isn't necessarily verbatim what we did, but in January, as I mentioned, having a kickoff meeting, creating a Slack channel or whatever communication tool that you use at your company to stay aligned cross-functionally, as well as establishing an email update cadence and a strong project document that you track every discussion, every note, every milestone, every pivot, every data piece found, every research that will influence other team members, just having a strong project doc that you as the product marketing manager really own and update throughout the entire process. From there in February, we had a cross-functional check-in one. I started doing the user research, started developing the positioning statement, the very first version, and then starting to run some marketing tests. And the marketing tests came in from the positioning statements. Once you kind of, kind of 
piece together a story, you want to make sure it sticks with your users. And so you kind of test that in emails, value props, do these words catch the user's eyes? Is this making sense to users? Will it drive adoption? Will it drive interest? And you can test it on different segments as well, right? You can test it out on your monthly active users, your laps, your unengaged, your kind of not loyal, but maybe loyal users. And from there, you can go into March with the final version of positioning. You can do your second cross-functional check-in and you can run more marketing tests to really make sure that the data from your previous round of testing is valid and reliable. From there, as you move forward, you'll have your third cross-functional check-in. Testing will continue really refining and making sure that it's really gonna stick with your users and really drive adoption and engagement. Um, you'll begin to start running internal trainings. Again, as I mentioned with our customer success teams, we wanted to make sure that they're ready to deal with district administrators that need to enable this product, teachers that may have questions, families that may have questions, and also to really confirm more of what you're doing, continue doing user research and really speak to your users and making sure that this is really building up into a big splash moment. And then finally in May, as you're getting closer to the summer, you wanna have your fourth and final sort of cross-functional check-in. You've completed your channel testing. You know exactly what channels will reach your users, what channels best stick, what has the most engagement and really what messaging stuck with your users. And then you wanna start begin thinking about launch. And then that's where June comes in, right before the big back to school season. You have your launch planning, you start developing your content and you make sure you're aligned with your product teams for the product milestones. And so along the way, as I mentioned, the key collaborators of the cross-functional teams are product, design, and growth. So on the product side, you wanna make sure that you're aligned on product milestones, engineering resources, as well as having a solid project plan that keeps you and your product managers aligned in that this product will be built and delivered when you're ready to sell it. You wanna make sure you're not marketing to your users that this product can do something and it actually can. Likewise, with design, you wanna make sure that they're supporting you on your user experience and making sure that they're there in the research and understanding what teachers are doing. Um, they'll, you can also support design with in-product content um, and also really making sure that customer needs are advocated for and present within the product. Likewise, working with the growth team, having them run channel tests, targeting segmentation and user data to make sure that you have a holistic view of how you're gonna market to, to your audience and what they're gonna use. And so I think that is what is a key tool in the product marketer's belt is user research. Um, for Clever Messaging, when we were looking at teachers and guardians and school districts, as I mentioned earlier, the market is just oversaturated. There's so many tools, teachers have adopted so many things. So what are we gonna do to get our product in front of them? And so with user research, I was able to talk to teachers and conduct interviews, you know, tens and tons of interviews, speaking to teachers of what's working, what's not, what needs they need to be met, what would be better, really making sure that informs our product roadmap, running surveys with teachers to make sure that, you know, we can have quantifiable data on actionable steps and really have an understanding qualitatively and quantitatively of what teachers are looking for and need in the upcoming school year. Also, you know, running usability tests with our teachers, making sure that the product makes sense. Does it drive engagement? Is it simple to use? Will it actually have teachers engaged? And then finally, running A-B tests and really positioning what teachers have said to us, our thoughts, and making sure it sticks and is really valid information that's driving teachers into usage for messaging. And so when that's done right, the successful research impact is one, quantitative data. What are their users doing? Two, qualitative data, how users are feeling. And then three, you get customer testimonials to shape and influence product. And so there may be moments along the line where this might sound like the right product to build for the right teacher for the right school, but really you can't go wrong with customer testimonials and really emphasizing what teachers are looking for. Likewise, with channel and messaging testing, you can really figure out how you're gonna reach teachers in this oversaturated market, this burnout. Are they checking their emails? Are they in the product or, or what are they doing? And so with channel and messaging testing, that's when you can test the various marketing channels. You can think through the value props, what in the messaging sticks out to teachers and gets them interested and driven and wanting to use the tool. You can think about the positioning statement. Does this catch 
a school district or a teacher or a family's eyes? Does this just sound like more tech trying to penetrate the school walls or is this really gonna benefit learning and teachers in their craft? And again, that goes with messaging. What sort of messages inspire teachers right now? What sort of messages do teachers wanna hear right now? Um, you know, we can always promise that we're gonna save their time, but is that what teachers are looking for? You just don't know. And with successful marketing test results, that was something that worked really well on our team is that when we tested the product with different teachers at different time points, we were able to more than double weekly active users of Clever Messaging. We increased feature usage by 10 times, a specific feature of Clever Messaging. And we really leveraged this in decision-making for product in the next steps of what the roadmap's gonna look like and how we should really prioritize different features that teachers and schools are looking for. And I think that's the key to successful storytelling. Research plus intuition equals story. You can do the research and you can get the data and you can get the qualitative findings and really understand what is happening in the market. But you as the product marketing manager are the voice of your customer. And for me, it's a different scenario. I was a teacher. I, I've lived that life. But I think that product marketers really need to trust what they think, right? Data and numbers can only tell a story so far, but that human aspect that all product marketers have can really lead to that story. And so that ended with us and on my take coming up with the story that Clever Messaging is the secure communication tool for teachers that synergizes a child's educational ecosystem because of instant centralized access to important information and the connection between teacher, student, and guardian where they already are, the Clever Portal. And to tie all that together, some of the best practices that I hope that you were able to glean from this talk was one, to over communicate always give as much information all the time, never leave product or design or growth marketing or stakeholders out of the loop, always share information, whether it's Slack, email, project doc, what have you. On that note, consistently updating project plans with current information. Um, you don't want customer success teams or product teams or design teams to not know what's going on and to also share information with customers and users, particularly when they're in support that isn't up to date and incorrect. Um, establish a cadence of cross-functional check-ins. Again, that goes with the over-communicating and making sure the project plans are updated. And as I had mentioned with the storytelling, really amplify the user and customer's voice in every discussion to unite stakeholders. And for me, really emphasizing what teachers needed, and that comes from the qualitative data and the quotes and the testimonials from teachers, really helped product design, engineers, stakeholders, really see what was at the heart here, right? Getting teachers to support their students. And likewise, data and research find these anchor decisions you make that may pivot from cross-functional stakeholders. And so my advice is when you're finding that research and you're finding that data as the product marketing manager, stand strong in your convictions and really use data and research to drive the ship and really get everyone on board to successfully launch on GTM. And on that note, just remember, you know your users the best and so advocate for them. I think that's one of the most crucial things as a product marketing manager is that you're the user's advocate. And so on that, I leave you. Thank you for coming to this talk. I hope that shined a little bit of light into what marketing for ed tech in 2021 looks like and the process of making sure that you can cross-functionally align and successfully go to market for your products. Uh, thank you and have a good day.
So just before we wrap up the content for today, I want to say a huge thank you again for joining us. I'm now delighted to hand over to Crayon, our headline sponsor, for some closing remarks. Be sure to join us again tomorrow. Product marketing festival goers, what a day! Day two of this year's event was an amazing one, and I can't thank you enough for giving me the opportunity to be your host for the day. In case you hadn't heard me say this enough, I'm Eric Manser, VP of Product Marketing at Crayon, and we're the title sponsor of the 2021 Product Marketing Alliance PNM Festival. I mean, seriously, how incredible was this day too? You heard Shridhar Ramanathan from Aventi Group tell you how to write a killer value proposition. You saw Jennifer Simonson from Tech Validate help educate you on how to fuel your organization with customer proof points. And you were a fly on the wall for an awesome panel discussion about one of the core elements of what it means to be a product marketer, messaging and positioning, led by Eve Brill from Farfetch. And like 20 more sessions in between those. On the off chance you missed any of what day two had to offer, head on over to the on-demand content library at the Product Marketing Alliance's website to find links to view the videos of each and every one of those incredible sessions. PMA members will have unlimited access to recordings from the festival alongside previous event footage, exclusive articles, templates, frameworks, and much, much more. And if you're still not a member, what are you waiting for? Head to productmarketingalliance.com and sign up today. Can you believe we have another full day of presentations tomorrow? We're gonna have presenters from enterprise companies from all over the world covering topics like customer onboarding, sales enablement, personas and customer segmentation, and a subject that's very near and dear to my heart, competitive intelligence. Why? Well, my company Crayon is recognized as the industry leader in market and competitive intelligence software. We believe that the use cases for CI go beyond simply using it for sales battle cards. In fact, competitive intelligence can drive real business impact all throughout your organization. Whether it's your product team finding valuable insights to direct their development roadmap, your customer success team being empowered to help fend off rivals who are trying to sign your clients away, or your C-suite using competitive intel to keep a finger on the pulse of the market, observing trends and making the decisions in a much more informed way. But please don't take my word for it. Industry organizations like the Product Marketing Alliance, independent market research firms like Forrester, and the enthusiastic reviews of our own users on G2 have said the exact same thing. For more information, head over to crayon.co and request a free demo of our software. And while you're there, check out some of the amazing free content that Crayon has created over the past seven plus years. It has been an honor and a pleasure to have been your host for today's event, and I even pulled double duty as a presenter. I'm Eric Manser. Thanks so much for attending day two of the 2021 Product Marketing Alliance Product Marketing Festival, and we will see you bright and early tomorrow morning for day three. Bye.